It is my pleasure, oh, much better, <laughs> to introduce um, Veronica Boix Mancilla. Um, she is a principal investigator of Project Zero at Harvard University, and she has collaborated with the IB in several projects framing interdisciplinary education for MYP and teaching the world studies extended essay design. Um, we also have Markin Kalf, who is a senior advisor of the Pulitzer Center, and Mark Schulte, the education director of the Pulitzer Center. They will be devoting the next hour um, to examining journalism as a means to prepare our youth for our global times. So please join me in welcoming Veronica, Marvin, and Mark. Thank you, Silvina. Um, so I, I am absolutely delighted to be here uh, with you and with my colleagues Marvin and, um, and, uh, and Mark because uh, we're going to be tackling a question that I think is, is, is incredibly timely and incredibly important, which is how it is that journalism helps us mediate what's happening in the world and the life, the individual intimate life of the children or the young people we, uh, we educate. Uh, there are enormous transformations in the field of journalism. Technology and the digital revolution has transformed uh, this field. And we as educators stand in a unique position as interpreters of the world for our children uh, to, um, to have the help, if you wish, uh, of journalism. Uh, um, as we uh, prepare our kids uh, for the world. What I would like to do, um, this is sort of the, uh, the, the, the title uh, of our talk. Uh, we're going to be examining uh, journalism as a means to prepare young people for a very interconnected uh, world. Uh, and we are in the presence of uh, incredibly experienced uh, individuals, Marvin Kalb and, um, and Mark uh, Schulte. Uh, I would like to first invite each one of them to introduce themselves very, very briefly so that you have a sense of who is in our panel. And after that, we're going to uh, move into three key questions about this field. Um, why does journalism matter? What constitutes quality journalism? And towards the end, we're going to introduce a new project um, in, that brings together uh, a variety of institutions to try to tackle this problem of journalism or the opportunities that journalism offers uh, for the IB. Um, so, Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning. I'm the education director at the Pulitzer Center, um, where I have been for three years now. Before that, for almost 10 years, I taught uh, what, what you might call global issues-based journalism at Washington International School. So, what I'm doing now is very similar to that. I don't have 30 kids in front of me all year. I have lots of different kids in lots of different schools, but what ties it together is the same idea, which is that um, I think uh, passionately that good global journalism is a critically important way to engage kids with the world. So that's why I'm here. Marvin? Um. Thank you. First of all, it's a privilege for me to be here, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, I used to teach Russian history at Harvard until 1957 when Edward R. Murrow, who I'm going to ask for a show of hands. We do know who he is, right? Okay. When Murrow um, invited me to join CBS, I then was a network correspondent for 30 years, working with uh, CBS and NBC, the Moscow correspondent, diplomatic correspondent, host to Meet the Press. And in 1987, I took over the responsibility of starting the Shorenstein Center at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And for the past 25 years, I've been the Murrow Professor, now emeritus, fortunately. And uh, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about journalism and its impact when my turn comes. 
Thank you, thank you, Marvin. So, so I was flying from Boston last night, and the most incredible thing happened. Um, I work at, at Harvard at Project Zero, and that's where I do research on interdisciplinarity and global uh, competence, global consciousness. So the most incredible thing happened. I'm sitting on a plane, and there's this young woman sitting next to me. I recognize she's not from the US, but you know, I don't know exactly what made me think uh, that way. But she was very sort of very active, very fidgety, so she was taking pictures of the sunset, a beautiful sunset, and with her, with her cell phone, and, um, and then I was concentrating on my magazine, but then I couldn't resist looking at the fact that uh, at some point she picks her phone and takes a selfie, yes, of course, a selfie on the plane, so we're sitting. So, and, 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 and the good news about kids taking a selfie, I looked at her on the image, Right on the image on her phone, she looked very pretty. I almost told her, "Yeah, that's it. Take that one because that's really because <laughs> that's the one." Um, uh, and and it almost like my generation thinks of that image as a mirror that she would have been able to see me, but no, she did not see me. So she was continuously selfieing, if that's a verb. It turns out that at some point, I'm thinking, "Well, this is really interesting." She's, you know, I'm, I wonder what who the audience is. This young woman has an audience, um, and. Um, Unavoidably, the selfie with the tongue out comes up as well. Selfie number 17 had the tongue to the side. I'm thinking, why do young people do this? What's the story behind the tongue? But what was very clear to me is that this it was very clear to me is that this young woman had an audience. This trip was an important one for her. And then I couldn't um, resist but you know, begin a conversation. She tells me that she's Colombian, that she uh, finished, um, she was visiting um, the family where she had um, been an, an exchange student uh, for some time, but she was now finishing in Colombia her first year uh, in journalism studies. And I said, wow. That's a coincidence, really interesting. And why did you get into journalism? And she says, I was thinking about doing medicine. But it turns out that when I um, lived in the United States, I recognized that uh, the world thinks of our country, Colombia, as the single story of um, corruption and narco-traffic uh, and so forth. And I did not like that. So I think I'm going to do journalism because I would like to sort of correct that story, tell other stories. And I said, how would, you, how would you decide which stories to tell? Which are the stories that you'd like to tell? And she insisted on the fact that Colombia is a contributor to oxygen, you know, so to, you know, to, to healthy you know, air uh, for us, that Colombia contributes flowers, it contributes uh, vegetables, uh, and, and so forth and so on, and that her story was going to be a story of the nature in Colombia, and how Colombia uh, is part in a very, very positive uh, way of all of these uh, markets uh, of goods that travel uh, around the world. The conversation dipped into the problems of global trade and so forth, uh, but by then we were landing and we had to, uh, we had to, we had to, uh, to move on. What I thought was really interesting is how present the audience was for this young woman. Uh, she had an audience, she had a message, and she had questions about how to tell the story or which stories uh, uh, to tell. So today we're going to be uh, asking ourselves three major questions, I'd say. The first one is, and this also sort of provides for us sort of a roadmap of sorts. So the first one uh, is the question of what, um, why is it that quality uh, journalism and perhaps media education matter for young people uh, today? Uh, and Marvin will be able to perhaps describe the arc of journalism as a profession uh, and share with us uh, in his incredible experience, you know, what he sees as the opportunities, the challenges, and the transformations in this field. Um, after that, we'll have um, uh, Mark. Um, uh, Marvin will tell us the story, and then Mark will... Um, uh, will uh, address the question of what constitutes quality journalism, especially at a time in which journalism is sort of up for grabs as to whether uh, my um, co-traveler's uh, co image of the sunset was a piece of news uh, or not that she was reporting uh, or not. So uh, there's a lot of confusion around what constitutes uh, quality journalism for young people and for the profession. So um, Mark will probably touch on that as well. And finally, um, I will um, share with you the question of how is it that we might nurture into discipline um, 
um, international mindedness through an integrated program that brings together interdisciplinary studies of uh, global issues, um, journalism, and new media studies. And what's exciting about this is that this is a very, very new initiative uh, for the IB uh, in collaboration with uh, the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, Project Zero, and the Washington International School, and Clayton Lewis is here with us today, so I'm glad that, you, that you're here. So that's the plan, and with uh, no further ado, I think I'll invite Marvin to join us and tell us the story of journalism. And why it matters. Thank you very much. Almost from the first day that I was at CBS, the July 4th weekend in 1957, Murrow was still there, still a journalist at CBS, but we were all talking about him constantly. I want to tell you two quick stories. The first is Murrow meeting on December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy, quote unquote, he was having a dinner date with the President of the United States, just the two of them. And that was the day of the severe surprise Japanese attack. Nobody knew quite how bad it was. The US government had not yet put out any information on the number of casualties, the number of ships that went down, planes, etc. cetera. Murrow meets with the President. The President gives no guidelines whatever but from a piece of paper tells Murrow how many casualties we suffered, the number of planes, the number of ships that went down. Murrow was shocked. He had the information. The president clearly wanted him to have it. When the dinner was over, Murrow left and he had a choice. He could go directly to the CBS office and broadcast that big scoop or go to his hotel. He decided to go to his hotel. As he explained it later, he would have had the story, but somehow it didn't feel right to him as a journalist and as an American to provide that information to the entire world because in his mind it might in some way or another help the Japanese who were the attackers. And so he didn't do it. Story number two. At the, in the spring of 1945, Murrow was one of the first invited to visit a Nazi concentration camp at Buchenwald. When he went in there with a number of other reporters, and I believe General Eisenhower as well, he was utterly astonished by the tragedy he was witnessing. He could not absorb it all. He went and talked to any number of people he got their stories. He met the mayor of Vienna, whom he had interviewed a year before. When the visit was over, Murrow again had a choice. He could find the nearest CBS booth and broadcast, or he could go to a hotel room, which is what he chose to do. For three days, Murrow did not broadcast the news of his visit to Buchenwald and what he had seen. Because, he explained later, he was looking for the words that could somehow convey the horror. He wanted to get the right words to convey it in the most meaningful way. And when he did, it was a magnificent broadcast, probably the greatest broadcast from World War II ever. You can find it on the internet, April 1945, Murrow Buchenwald. What he said at the end was, I pray you to believe what I have just reported. Because it was so bad, he didn't believe that the people would truly believe him. One, I have had many journalism classes where those issues, those two stories, have been dissected and discussed. And I don't want you to share any common experience. All I can tell you is that they were great uh, and meaningful sessions, I think, to the students principally. Because they gave us a sense of what was the journalism back then. 
and Veronica spoke about this arc of journalism. If you live long enough, you, um, you will have had the, the good luck of having experienced a good part of that arc. And that was where Murrow was in those days. I would venture to say that today, if Murrow after Buchenwald was some similar experience, had gone back to his hotel and not reported it for CBS, he'd have been fired. But in those days, it was not the excitement of the, the bulletin. It was truly trying to get it right within a context that was meaningful. In my own personal experience in 1962, um, I believe, I was in Berlin. President Kennedy was visiting. Um, uh, he left, we were left behind, and to do a broadcast was the first broadcast where a reporter overseas would be cut live into the CBS Evening News with Cronkite. It was an incredible experience, and when it was over, I didn't believe what had happened. And I called my wife and I said, do you see the news tonight? She said, yes. I said, was I on? She said, yes, it was very exciting. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. But what was happening then was that technology was beginning to move into journalism and to affect what it is that journalism as a routine thing did. Covering the Vietnam War, quick experience. Uh, in Da Nang, 1965, I walk into the bar on the Air Force Base and a young lieutenant sees me, recognized me, came over, can we have a drink? Sure. Um, and he says, you know what we're gonna be doing tonight, Mr. Kalb? I said, what's that? He says, we're gonna bomb Hanoi. He was very excited. We had never bombed Hanoi. It was a huge story. He clearly had made a mistake. He should never have told me that. What do I do? I walked out of the bar and went to the general's headquarters, the general I had known from covering at the Pentagon. I said, General, I understand you're going to be bombing Hanoi tonight. Is that right? <laughs> and I was astonished by his answer. Yes, he answered. What are you going to do about it? Ah, he threw it back to me. And what I did about it was nothing. I did not broadcast because I couldn't imagine uh, that young man being shot down because I got a big exclusive. Um, today, if that were to have happened, the reporter would be fired because you have to get the news on, the competition is that severe. In the late 1960s, CBS started a program called 60 Minutes, very famous program, news magazine. What 60 Minutes did for the first time in the news business was make money. We had always been a loss leader. First time it made money. Impact, enormous. Why? Because every other news program on any other network and newspapers had to follow the same example. You had to make money. There had to be a profit in money to what it is that you were doing, else you were a failure. That seeped in like a virus into the system of journalism. And it coincided in the late 1970s, 1980s, with the rise of two revolutionary forces which profoundly transformed journalism. One was financial and the other was technological. Because 60 Minutes could make money, all of the people running every news organization decided they had to make money and no longer accept news as a lost leader. The impact that that had on editors, producers, was profound because everyone had to tailor what it is that they were doing, not for the news quality, but for the capacity of the news to make money for the organization. 
<clears throat> that is now so deeply embedded into the culture of journalism that to imagine it not making money is to imagine the unimaginable. Right now, news is a big business, and that has to be understood right up front. On the technological side, with, in the 1990s, the rise of all of the talk shows of cable news, CNN in the 80s, Fox in the 90s, MSNBC in the 90s, that introduced a whole new element which connected to the desire to make profit, in my judgment, has now transformed journalism into something so different from what it was <clears throat> in Murrow's time as to be just about unrecognizable. And what we have today in the web world is both an adventure, because there are many positive features to it, but also a challenge that I regard, again, as basic, uh, um, absolutely fundamental. The challenge is that with the new technology, you can come upon information, you can come upon imagery that was unimaginable before, but it's now there for you to use in a classroom. If you go in one morning and you suddenly find that there is a green revolution taking place in Iran, and you want to find out what is happening, what is it that you as teachers do? You can turn to your iPhone, you can turn to a television, you can turn uh, to the computer. There are many ways that you can find out and get fact. But you've got to be careful with the fact. Elie Wiesel has always said that we live in a world today where facts can be spread across the entire globe. There are so many of them. But it takes a certain amount of effort on all of our parts to elevate the fact to knowledge. The kind of knowledge that you can use in a concrete form and that you can be comfortable using. You feel it's right. And then it takes you to the highest level of all, which is wisdom. When to use the information and for what purpose. So the information is there, and bless the technology for giving it to us, but how we use it is fundamental. And here comes the challenge. In my opinion, and that's all I'm imparting is my opinion, I've spent 25 years of my life as a journalist using microphones and cameras. I have always regarded that as a kind of teaching. I used to teach Russian history, and now I teach whatever it is that I'm covering. But I feel I have the same obligation to my audience, which as a teacher are my students, to make sure that what I'm giving them is right. I must be comfortable with the information first before I can pass it on to them. And that is an essential challenge. And the reason, one reason I say this is in terms of our personal responsibility um, in this new global environment. I remember, and we were talking about this at breakfast, I remember um, covering the Kennedy assassination and the way in which Washington for three days and therefore the entire country for three days, bonded around our television sets to find out what it is that was going on. We as a nation were wounded, and we felt pain, and we wanted to know things. And my responsibility on, on one assignment was in front of St. Matthew's on Rhode Island Avenue when the entire procession came down, including the casket and the white horse, and young John John Kennedy stood in front of the church with his mother, his sister, 
And John was about three years old at the time. And I'll never forget him saluting the casket as it walked by. It was an amazing scene. How do you teach that? Incredibly difficult unless you can show it. If you show it, you are depending upon the validity and the accuracy of the film you are using. In the world in which we live today, it is extraordinarily difficult to get to the origin of a piece of film. If you can just hold up your iPhone and take a picture of something, it does not necessarily convey reality. It conveys only what you're pointing at. And what you're pointing out might be the most important thing that happened that day in Iran during the Green Revolution. Or it could be a picture provided by the government in order to convey a certain impression. Or it could actually be the right image for the time. How do you know that you don't? So how do you get to the point in your decision making where you're comfortable showing that to your students? It is an enormous responsibility. And I leave and pass it on to Mark uh, simply with an appeal, really, that having been, in my own experience, blessed with being a journalist in the field and then a teacher in a classroom, I know that the two are essentially the same. And without journalism, we are not free people anywhere in the world. Without a free press, you are not a free person. And the role of journalism is so central that, in my judgment, it must become part of the curriculum of the classroom and our lives. Thank you very much. I would like to ask you a question. Would you, <clears throat> would you like to follow Marvin Kalb to the mic? <laughs> Please be kind. Um, so I'm going to start with three problems. Um, they're very much uh, related to some of the things that Marvin was addressing. Can everyone hear me OK? There is less money today for good international reporting um, than there ever has been. Um, there is money in the media. But for some of the reasons that Marvin was outlining, um, editors, commercial interests are choosing to put less of that into good global reporting than they ever have. So this leads to shortcuts, mistakes, mistakes which get repeated, and in general, shallow reporting. This has been going on now since the sort of internet revolution, and um, you can see it in the current generation, I think. Uh, related, we are in a new media ecosystem that places much more responsibility on the consumer than ever before to figure out what is credible and maybe even more than that, what, is, what a healthy media diet consists of in the first place. So this can be a very good thing if we have the right skills and appetites. Again, as Marvin was pointing out, the facts are out there. The facts are spread around the world. The facts are immediately accessible if you have an internet-connected computer. But you have to have the right appetites and the right skills to turn those into knowledge. Younger generations, third problem, are losing the news habit. Pew did a study maybe about eight years ago where they looked at uh, the silent boomer generation X, me, millennials. And they looked at these, the news consumption habits of these generations over a period of eight years. The idea was to say, how much does their consumption of good news change over eight years? And what you see on the one hand, is a very noticeable drop-off by generation in consumption of serious news. 
and no adjustment, no, no significant adjustment over eight years. In other words, um, the millennials are not catching up to the uh, boomers who are not catching up to the silent generation. So we can deal with these problems in a couple of ways. We can begin to deal with them in a couple of ways. One is by um, supply and the other is by demand. So the, uh, the Pulitzer Center is a news supplier, okay? We fund global reporting projects that we think are important and we help reporters place those in major media outlets. Um, what we wanna do is give reporters the freedom, the time and space, and that comes down to money, to tell a story in the right way, to spend the time they need to tell it in the right way, so that the full story, the accurate story, um, emerges. So what does good global reporting look like? I'm gonna share the following short film and encourage you to reflect on what is worth examining and what techniques are useful in conveying that. Um, one more thing I think we wanna do is lower the light, so I'm just gonna hustle back here. Yo pienso que en, el, en, en esta en, en, el, en lo que es el, el ser humano, el ser humano tiene como, como una estás como predestinado para algo. Eso es eh, autenticismo, autenticidad en una persona. Yo, yo siempre he dicho que, que yo siempre voy a ser pescador porque soy pescador auténtico porque es, una actividad, es la actividad que, que más me gusta hacer en mi vida. Cuando empecé a bucear, yo, yo me empecé a dar cuenta de que bajar era, era explorar otro mundo. Era muy diferente a, a estar en la superficie y te sientes, te sientes en, otro, en, en, otro, en, otro, en, otra, en otra dimensión, en otro ambiente. Y, y, y ese, eso se vuelve como interesante. Te, Te, te invita a seguir a seguir con la a, a seguir haciéndolo Sí, sí es cierto que ha habido cambios y, y yo siento que son cambios drásticos, ¿eh? cambios que me han que me han puesto a mí a, a un poco alerta de decir, bueno, antes como pa, por decir un ejemplo, en, eh, en los en los 90, en, en 1990, eh, en la en, en Isla Tiburón, por decir así, a 5 a 10 metros de profundidad, yo, yo pescaba con arpón pescaba garropas hasta de 40 a 50 kilos y, y ahora, ahora no tengo aproximadamente cerca de de 5 o 10 años que no miro una especie de ese tamaño Hace aproximadamente unos cinco años, digamos, eh, estuvo en, en auge 
estuvo muy, muy, muy concurrido, la, por, muy visitadas las, todas estas regiones, precisamente por narcotraficantes que pasaban, venían de Sinaloa, venían de, de Nayarit, y, y, y era el paso obligado hacia el norte. Eh, antes antes de, de, de la anfetamina, del cristal, eh, estaba la cocaína. La cocaína era, era, era muy utilizada por pescadores, principalmente buzos nocturnos, para poder eh, soportar toda la noche o parte, gran parte de la noche buceando y, y, sin, y, sin, ¿no? y sin sentir sueño. Eh, ya surgió el cristal y, y hicieron un poco a, a, totalmente a un lado la cocaína y, y escogieron la, el cristal por ser más, según ellos, más efectivo. Si yo, si yo por decir así, eh, digamos que, como por ejemplo, si, si, tú, si tú eres mi padre, eh, yo te miro a ti y te miro en una embarcación en la que va, te vas en la mañana, en la madrugada, a las 5 de la mañana y regresas oscureciendo y apenas traes para, para, para que comamos y yo me miro y no tengo zapatos y me miro y quiero, quiero, que quiero disfrutar de la vida y, y, y no, y no, y no, y no, y no, y tú como mi padre no me das, no, no puedes traer lo suficiente porque supuestamente el mar no te da. En una persona como es un niño con una, con una conciencia inocente, con una mente, con, 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 con un criterio no muy amplio de conocimiento que, que solo ve eh, en ti como narcotraficante comodidades, lujos y, y facilidades para todo. Y, y en ti como, como el padre, carencias, sufrimientos, eh, hambres, y, y, y entonces él dice, no, pues yo no quiero ser pescador, yo quiero ser narco. Nunca me, ve, me veo eh, cultivando tierras, o sí sé, sí sé, y conozco cómo se hace todo, pero no, no, no es algo que que yo sienta que me levanto en la mañana y quiero ir a ver, a, a ver las plantas y regarlas o a ver si tienen plagas y eso no. Yo quiero ir venir al mar y a ver cómo está el tiempo y se pueda salir a pescar. Y, y si estoy allá en el desierto, allá estoy pensando en el mar, a qué hora voy a poder venir y estar y, y sentir la brisa y, y estar y, y sentir. Yo sí me siento libre, siento una, una, un, una gran libertad interna cuando estoy pescando cuando estoy en el, en, el, en el mar. Uh, the, the movie that you just watched was produced in conjunction with a long-form written piece in Harper's Magazine and a, a series of still photos that were published last summer. Um, we supported it as part of a larger and ongoing look at the local costs of the global commodities trade. So this is, a, this is a, our approach in general, and it's one that, that I think and I hope will resonate with um, international educators who are looking at certain buckets um, to help kids make sense of the world. Um, we think that these subjects uh, don't get the attention they deserve, and um, you can find them on our website, pulitzercenter.org, under the gateways section. So this project that I just showed you would be under um, global goods, local costs. We also have sections for fragile states, for climate change, water and sanitation, um, lots of public health reporting, et cetera, which I, which I think will be, again, familiar uh, to most of you. So looking in particular at the global commodities process, do we think that that's a subject that's worth special attention in an educational setting? If so, how might journalism speak to that subject in a way that's useful and effective. So if you look at the bullet points here, I'll just go through them and we can see sort of how um, that film measures up. You're not advancing. 
Okay, I'll go ahead. C a compelling story. Um, I hope you found the story of the Sari fisherman compelling. Um, how important is this? I think it's very important if you're interested in cultivating a lifelong set of appetites and interests rather than just imparting information. Um, I, I'm not sure the authors of academic texts always hold themselves to that standard. Deep reporting, um, generally not literally underwater, but in this case, the photographer spent weeks on the beach in, in the Sea of Cortez where these Seri fishermen who are not interested in talking to outsiders at all um, work. He sat there for weeks, hanging out, um, waiting for someone to talk to him, projecting, you know, a sort of non-threatening pose and was close to giving up, was literally walking away when finally one of them went, hey, loser, come over here, what, what are you doing? What's, that's how he got this story. That takes a lot of time. And again, uh, uh, media outlets do not think it's worth um, putting somebody on a beach for weeks to get a story like this. Um, challenging conventional ways of thinking. Are we looking at something from a new perspective? Or are we reinforcing familiar narratives? Are we assigning blame? Making the complex accessible. This, again, I think is part of the genius of good journalism. Here you have an individual's story, very relatable. You get a sense for who this guy is and, and what his life is about. You know, he speaks of being an authentic person. So suddenly this Byzantine process, globalization, which we all kind of struggle to define, um, is individualized in a way that's, I think, appealing. So we're building towards a deeper understanding of interconnected systems. A magazine article, this short video, a, a photograph, whatever it might be, are just parts of a flow of information, not standalone or static explanations. If it's a good flow, it leads to deeper understanding. And I think with more work like this, we can begin to solve the problems, those three problems that I mentioned earlier. More high quality journalism on important but complex global issues will lead to a better informed public who are already paying attention to journalism, which is to say slightly older generations. But I think it will also help on the demand side by attracting young people who are looking for authentic ways to make sense of their world. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Veronica. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So, so if we look at what we have experienced so far, um, I suppose that many of us began this morning with uh, Alan November. Were you there? Um, and, um, and he enabled us to look a little bit more quickly at the news, the information that we receive on the internet and the, and, and the media uh, and, and, and so forth. Then uh, Marvin gave us an arc of journalism uh, with uh, a profound commitment to democracy and the role that journalism plays in keeping us free and keeping us understanding uh, the world uh, in, which, in which we live. Um, and uh, and um, Mark uh, helped us see how a particular story that is not a mainstream story is not the first thing that appears when you Google um, when you Google fishing um, will um, how a story is constructed uh, how delicately it is constructed uh, and how it embodies so much. Uh, of the dynamics that are defining the world, uh, the world in which uh, the world in which we live. Um, so, what I would like to do uh, then is to challenge us to think about uh, how it is that um, an integrated approach to uh, understanding uh, the world uh, through journalism, interdisciplinary studies, and new media studies uh, might enable us to. Um, to deepen the international mindedness uh, of our kids. We are all committed in the classroom to open the world to our students. We're committed as international uh, educators to be in a way uh, brokers between a world that is changing incredibly fast uh, and the private 
individual life uh, of the children uh, that are uh, in, in our classrooms. So at the... Um, um, the opportunities that we uh, that we see uh, with journalism in a more integrated way uh, involve, uh, I would say, sort of three core dimensions. The first dimension is the possibility that we might find in placing a story that we read or that we invite kids to read, just like the story that we just saw, in the broader context that it would allow kids to young people to understand the deeper meaning of the story. So we have the story of this individual fisherman, very compelling, very relatable, uh, very inviting, and that's what good, good journalism does. And yet, there's so many questions that could be raised about this story. So what's the broader context? What are the economic dynamics uh, of this, you know, of, of this story? What are the tensions? Who is against whom? Um, what can we do sort of about the changing uh, environments, you know, the, the, the biology, if you wish, of, uh, of, uh, of, of the fisheries? So when we look at uh, the problem like global goods and local costs, the local costs of, uh, of international trade uh, in more depth, we might see that we need to use the lenses of economics, perhaps biology, perhaps sociology or anthropology, perhaps policy uh, and or law, in order to understand the problem a little bit more fully. And in this project that we're um, initiating uh, this year uh, in collaboration, uh, as I said, with, uh, with, with the IB, uh, we're going to be looking very, very uh, closely at how a problem such as local, you know, global goods and local costs can be interpreted or, re or read through the lenses of these disciplines. So for example, it matters that kids understand that uh, fishing constitutes uh, something like, that the fishing in that particular area constitutes something like 80% of the fishery production uh, of, uh, of Mexico uh, right now. That 90% of the shrimp that Mexico produces come uh, from this area. That there's, uh, that the employment opportunities, the employment in this area of something like 60,000 um, uh, fishermen uh, in Mexico overall uh, contributes to the economic development uh, of the country. At the same time, stopping there with an economic story of growth in GDP is certainly not the full story. If we move from economics or we move into economics and we look at difference in uh, income and income distribution throughout society, we see that the stories are a bit more complex, that all of this wealth, all of this growth tends to be concentrated on particular uh, social groups. And we need to step into sociology or anthropology to begin to understand the impact of this vast economic growth on the communities. We saw in the informant in this story, we saw the split between generations. My children don't look up to me any longer. We saw what happens with a community, a sense of togetherness, a sense of tradition. And we saw the very many, you know, as we see the many very, the very many villages uh, around Latin America, around sort of in, in, in the US, the towns that are being transformed by the sweeping um, uh, economic and fast economic uh, growth uh, that, uh, that transforms economic as well as social relationships uh, among um, uh, among participants, you know, folks who live in the village or folks who, uh, who, who live in town. And we need to understand that. We need to understand when our informant says, I am a fisherman, my identity is that of a fisherman. We need to understand that I believe, you know, he says, that we are predestined uh, for a certain life. We need to understand that if we are going to be sort of democratically um, uh, able to interact with one another in respectful ways. So economics is not the full story. We need to step into sociology, anthropology in order to understand this problem in a more complex way. And that, you know, of course, the story doesn't stop right there. We need to understand why. Why that area? Why is it that, um, why is it that the fisheries concentrate in this particular region? And if we look into it, we see that uh, that, of course, is a collection of mangrove uh, forests that are uh, feeding the fish in this particular place that uh, ecologists claim is essential for the survival and for the well-being of the oceans in that particular region. And uh, fishermen think it's you know is, is is a good opportunity to 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 produce and catch you know, and catch and catch more fish. So we need to understand the ecologic dimensions as well and the impact um, of global 
trade and uh, global goods uh, on the on on these local uh, on these local settings and finally of course we need some solutions we need some ways to mediate um, the relationship between individuals uh, and their environments, individuals and society. And for that, we might draw into policy and law and help our students understand, you know, what legal context and possibilities um, exist uh, in this way. So if we look at understanding into understanding this problem, this particular story in more depth, we are bound to bounce in between different disciplines and we need to recruit the expertise from these disciplines in order to understand this in a little bit more depth. And that can be done in a very, very simple way, uh, almost playful way with very little children in the PYP or in a very sophisticated way in something like the World Studies Extended Essay uh, for the diploma, for the diploma uh, students. So this is, uh, in many ways, um, a call for depth uh, in understanding and contextualizing journalistic production and really connecting what we teach in our disciplines with what's happening in the world. It's the question of why am I learning this? Well, you're learning this because it helps you read the world in better and deeper ways. So that's um, dimension number one, a deep interdisciplinary understanding of these global uh, issues as an invitation, which enable us to look at you know human environment interactions, the consequences of short and long-term positive, negative, intentional, unintentional consequences. It really invites us to look at these problems in more complex, rich, systemic uh, ways. The second dimension, or the second big opportunity, of course, uh, in, this, uh, in this problem space is journalism. And as Mark said, you know, there are very important qualities about, uh, about journalism. And I think that, and, and he mentioned them, I won't repeat them. But I think that there are two uh, interesting entry points into this world of journalism for us as educators. One is certainly critical engagement with it. You know, where do we bring the journalistic production into our classrooms to speak to the topics that we are that we are that we are teaching, and how do we engage these productions, these articles, these news uh, reports uh, in a critical way? How can we help our students uh, understand uh, these uh, more critically? And uh, the journalistic production of students themselves um, it presents itself as a great opportunity too for students to. Uh, integrate what they have learned perhaps in one or multiple disciplines into a particular story that they can account for, that they can investigate in depth, that they can zoom into uh, and find depth, uh, depth in. So if you see so far, we have pretty much a good invitation to, to, um, to look at global issues such as you know, global trade, such as climate change and so forth in some depth. Uh, as well as with very, very contemporary relevance as students engage in journalistic production. And finally, we have young people, very much as, uh, as Alan was uh, describing uh, this morning, we have young people who are incredibly energized, just like my, my friend sitting next to me on the plane, incredibly energized to participate, to use new technologies. We have a, a generation that has enormous, enormous energy and capacity to deal with sort of the initial aspects of technological um, behavior, uh, if you wish. Um, and at the same time, this is a generation that needs enormous amounts of help. There's no question in my mind that young people today read the news. It just so happens that it's news about Beyonce and what Rihanna is doing and who went with whom to the, to the local party. They're very much up on the news. It's not that they're not, but they do need our guidance, I believe, in, uh, in looking for the deeper news, the, more, the news that have longer residuals, so to speak, in terms of orienting uh, them in their lives. And, 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 and I think that in that, uh, in that sense here, too, we find at the intersection of journalism and education a really, really powerful um, a powerful opportunity. So here too, if we were to really take this opportunity in full, in its full expression, I think that we would delve into helping young kids develop digital 
uh, literacy and 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 ethics uh, in the in 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 on the web. You know very much what Marvin you were saying earlier. What do I choose to post? What do I choose not to post? We've seen enormous consequences, very very negative in some cases, of postings that have been socially very destructive for kids. You know, bullying, cyberbullying, and so forth. So, how can we? This is an opportunity for us to to really delve into the problem space of participating in the internet, participating with new technologies, and doing so carefully with um, sort of an ethical standard that, that matters. And what's beautiful about it is that it puts all of us, together with the kids, in a position of learning. We need to sort of read up on what's the ethics of you know, digital participation and what we know, what we don't know. So there's a great deal of, uh, of work that's emerging in this area, and it's, uh, and it's a very important area of work. And finally, here too, this sort of this piece echoes on what Alan was saying this morning. Um, the opportunity at this intersection of interdisciplinary studies, journalism, and digital uh, digital media is one of expanding beyond the feudal systems in which we have fallen by default on the internet. Um, Ethan Zuckerman, who works at MIT at the Media Lab, has a beautiful book. Um, called Rewired, um, and he, uh, he, 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 he defines the notion of uh, digital cosmopolitanism as this problematic in, 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 in many ways uh, idea that we are connected technologically, we can access the computers of people all around the world, and yet when it comes to ideas, worldviews, perceptions of one another and so forth, we're as tribal as we could be. So if we look at our behavior on the internet, it's incredibly tribal. Um, so uh, how to become more cosmopolitan in content, how to reach out for what is different, how to seek what is different from what we expect is a, is a disposition, a critical disposition that matters enormously uh, for us uh, today and for young people uh, today. Because again, our democracy uh, pivots on our capacity to understand difference. Um, and the internet is not necessarily helping us out in understanding difference in depth. So being quite proactive as educators in trying to reach out to this difference and helping kids uh, find the Iranian uh, hostage crisis, as Alan was saying, uh, in Persian with translation. That's very, very important. Very important. So. We've been thinking about this problem space for a little bit of time, and, um, and, and a few of us got together, Pulitzer Center, and Project Zero, and the IB, and uh, the Washington International uh, School. We thought maybe we should begin to think about a project that, um, that brings some of these, uh, some of these uh, ideas uh, together. Uh, in a very practical way, so that we can both uh, understand this problem space in a very integrated way and invite in a very experimental way young students or students and teachers to participate and to, uh, to understand some of these issues, to understand them interdisciplinarily, uh, to, uh, to engage in analysis of uh, journalism and um, production uh, of journalism, and, um, and, and, and to understand how to navigate the web and how to participate in digital uh, context. And it was uh, a very sort of fortunate moment in which, um, um, and, um, in which Judith Fabian, who's sitting there in the audience, um, and I were having lunch, and I shared this idea with her, and she said, that sounds like a good idea. So <laughs> let's, let's, let's think about how we move it forward. So right now, we're super excited because we're at the very, very, very beginning of a project that will hopefully take a few years. It's not, nothing is happening next September in terms of schools. But we're, uh, we're designing a project um, that is a pilot, sort of a concept um, uh, um, a concept proof, if you wish, uh, of a project that would uh, uh, include, the, that would uh, consist of um, the following sort of elements. Um, a main goal is to develop a learning space, a digital learning space, and a collection of very, very flexible modules that will focus on global issues 
understood through interdisciplinary lenses, understood as they are represented in the media, um, and with opportunities for young people to produce their own journalism uh, accounts and their own journalism uh, investigations. Uh, we're imagining this learning space to be digital, uh, as well as sort of elements of you know face to face, and we're imagining this um, uh, this learning space to be extremely flexible. So that if I am teaching geography and there is a Pulitzer Center video that I can use, and that's all I can do, I'll use the video, and perhaps I consider a few recommended. Um, forms of engagement with the video. And if I happen to lead a collection of CAS students doing uh, the projects or, or, um, or extended essay students leading uh, the projects, then I might invite my student to zoom in to that particular aspect or the particular place in this digital uh, learning space uh, so that uh, he would find rich sources, he would find perspectives from different disciplinarians as to how they view a particular problem, he would find um, tasks or forms of engaging with different media, he would find um, perhaps uh, some uh, tutorials as to how to produce journalism, how to uh, do, you know, both from the technological to the deep. Um, he would find uh, analysis or comparative analysis of productions of journalism um, from different you know, from different sources. So the idea is that in this space, um, we would have both a space that can be navigated by teachers and by educators very broadly, as well as um, a collection of modules that are like you know like classes, uh, so to speak. Um, that can be um, that can be uh, taken uh, uh, and taught. So we're in the very 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 beginning of um, of this uh, of this project. We are uh, zooming into very very careful and more detailed design in September uh, when we start. We know that we will be able to uh, invite a, the pilot young students who produce journalistic accounts. Um, to publish them, and uh, they will be published them in the uh, News Action Network, which is a youth, f by youth for youth uh, journalism um, site uh, led by uh, and created by the Washington International School. So um, I don't know, Clayton, if you wanted to say a little bit about the network and what it looks like. And we'll say a few more words, and then probably we'll open it up for questions, comments, and observations, shall we? Thank you, Veronica. Uh, the uh, Washington International School has been experimenting for some years with some of these models that, that, that you've heard about today of really trying to engage young people in uh, real issues, real st stories, not, not the ones that are hitting the front page of the paper necessarily, but the ones that are perhaps close, close to home that could be f fantastic um, in-depth uh, studies that, that meet almost all of these criteria. Uh, and, and those stories are often uh, right around the corner if they just have their eyes and, and ears open. Uh, the challenge that we uh, continue to face in doing this is, is tr in trying to embed it in the classroom. There's not just something extra that the students are doing, that is not extracurricular, uh, just to be done on their own time, but uh, teachers being creative and thinking about ways uh, to uh, perhaps take something away that they've normally done and look at journalism and media production article production uh, as a, a fantastic tool for helping kids to go, to go deep and to go interdisciplinary and to think things through. And then taking Alan's uh, message today, uh, instead of the traditional model that who is your audience, well, your teacher who will market, give it back to you and so forth, your audience becomes the world. And you can build up a following of um, um, young people and older people who actually care about your voice. So uh, we are uh, wide open to be building partnerships. Uh, all of us are interested in building partnerships with like-minded schools that would like to be out of the box and looking for ways to generate quality media that could go up on a, uh, a network 100% containing quality media produced by students. Thank you. Thank you. 
So, uh, so we're quite excited about the pos about the possibility. Let me just very briefly sort of outline the sort of the additional goals that we have sort of in this in this project. So the main goal is this design of this uh, learning infrastructure, if you wish, uh, the learning collection of uh, of modules for which we'll start very very small this first year. We are committed to supporting educators, so, that, so we're thinking about adding sort of a professional development component to it, so that as teachers we can learn how to uh, navigate and how to how to how to do this type of work. Um, we are uh, really quite interested in understanding the impact of this int integrated approach to global issues that involves interdisciplinary, journalistic, and new media. Um, uh, dimensions. We're really interested in understanding what impact this has on students. We're really, really intrigued, and on teachers. So we're really, really intrigued by sort of a research component uh, to this that will help us understand how this changes or not the experience of young uh, people in our classrooms. And finally, uh, we believe that behind this might be sort of a more conceptual model that could be applied in a variety of different places and so forth. It's, as you can imagine, incredibly early to even be begin to articulate that uh, at this time. Um, but where we have an eye on really trying to, uh, to, to, to think about how one captures the essence of this integrated approach so that eventually it can be uh, applied, transformed, recreated in a variety of different, uh, of different contexts. And I would say, just to finish, that one, one quality that we particularly appreciate about this, uh, about this initiative is uh, our commitment to, uh, to hosting, to having a great deal of this work be uh, directly related to, um, to the IB and students and teachers in the IB, but also to fulfill our democratic commitment to students who may not have the privilege or the benefits of an IB education. So we're thinking about hosting a good portion of this as open source and online. So I'm really excited about this. I think that this is incredibly forward looking. And I think that uh, sort of as sort of a, a close friend uh, of the IB, this feels uh, like, like, like part of the leadership uh, that, 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 that the IB can, can, can play this leadership role in international education. So with that, how about I just uh, close my mouth and we, uh, and we uh, open it up for comments, reactions, puzzles, questions. Um, yes, Joe. Um, you and a handful of other journalists, um, um, I'm going to say, are responsible for uh, moving me towards becoming a news junkie by the time I was in eighth grade <laughs> in 1968. Um, and then I went on to become a print journalist for about 25 years or so ago. And now I'm teaching journalism to eighth graders. Um, uh, Mark touched on this a little bit, talking about shallow journalism. There's just so much of it out there now that students are influenced by. And um, I guess what I want to ask is how do you think that I can get them beyond that or is 12 or 13 too young of an age to get them to start thinking about more serious journalism? The question is, how is 12 or 13, 12 or 13 too early to begin to think about journalism? Um, well, Joe, on, on the teaching of it, um, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, I really haven't ever taught 12 or 13 year olds except my two daughters, and I knew that I couldn't teach them anything. <laughs> um, Don Hewitt, great CBS producer, once said that the essence of journalism is to tell me a story. Now, let's say you had something that you wanted to convey. Is there a way of conveying it as a story? Uh, personalizing it, perhaps. Um, putting it within a frame that is familiar to them which you would know as a teacher, um, seeing if you can slip that narrative through that frame. 
so that it grabs them at the other end, it holds their attention because you're telling them a story. That to me is always the essence of good journalism, whether you're covering a presidential campaign or a local election. Um, it's a story. And I think you lose your viewers and you lose your audience, even in a classroom, if you, if you lose that focus. Forgive me, I can't take it any further than that. I wish I could. Um, but I haven't had that experience in a, in a classroom. So for me, it's a theoretical exercise rather than a real one. Have a good, we'll have a good discussion about uh, what you said, that we need to be careful with the facts. Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the facts are the, the essence of any good story. Uh, but you're still telling a story. And you have to assume that the facts are right and that you have checked them out, that you personally are responsible for what it is that you're putting in these minds. So you've got to be comfortable yourself with what you're passing on. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Can I, can I just chime in really quickly? I, I would just say, um, Joe, that, that I, think we, I think it's a, it's a great age um, to, to, to be talking about these kinds of issues and to be um, weaving in in a serious way the, the kinds of modules that Veronica was describing. I think we, we need to start as early as we can because, again, it's about developing a life, <clears throat> a life a lifetime of habits and appetites, and uh, you don't want to be correcting that um, later. And also, middle schoolers and and um, you know young high schoolers are much less encumbered by testing and college and so forth than the older kids tend to be. And it's I think it's a great age to get them excited about um, you know participating in this this kind of a way. No. Two two weeks ago, I, I am from Peru. Two weeks ago, I went to Cuancavelica. This is 4,800 meters over the sea, and I went to a town named Ticrapio. It's like Macondo, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. It's lost, yeah? And, you know, I had a meeting with some teachers, and I returned, and I really thought I had a story. And I told the editor, and I sent it to him, and he said, Ana Maria, good story, but you have to sell it more. So he used, you, you spoke about the essence of journalism, no? But he thinks it's telling a story and you have to sell it. Did you ever think of that verb when you write? Or we should think about selling? That's a verb. Um, I, I love that idea. So the, the idea of selling the story, the idea of you know changing the conversation with kids from this is what I have to do, I, I need to fill 10 to 12 pages, and I need to... Um, Sound academic. It needs to be a, a, you know, it needs to be the, it needs to check off the right boxes too. I'm trying to, I'm trying to communicate a message that is appealing and clear, and accurate, and really change the, change the dynamic to, to the, to the student as, you know, someone who thinks of their audience as more than just, their, their teacher is great, but you know, the whole world. I saw that. I saw that happen as a teacher. Um, the kids were writing for a print newspaper, when we switched to online, they, they instinctively understood that there were many more potential people uh, reading their work, and they worked harder on it. So, I, in, in, in our experience, and I think this responds to both of your observations, we've had, um, at Project Zero, we're developing something called global thinking routines, which are like very, very small, sort of stepwise, um, uh, thinking paths, if you wish, you know, little small interventions that are like take the form of questions sometimes. So one of them is um, why, the th we call it the three whys, why, and the questions go like this, why does this matter to me? Why does this matter to my people and my place? And why does this matter to the world? What's very interesting is that the teachers who are in fifth grade teachers who are inviting students to write stories and so forth uh, in Portland, which is a project that we uh, were, a city where we're working quite closely, um, 
uh, what we have noticed is that the children move from thinking that the stories that they need to write need to fit sort of common core criteria of, you know, from punctuation to, uh, you know, introduction, middle and end and so forth and conclusion to the essence of the story and why the story, why anybody should care reading uh, the story. What the teachers report is that by uh, recapturing the sense of relevance of these stories, the students are much better uh, able to uh, to ask better questions when they interview people in their communities and uh, able to um, project the stories to the audiences that they're seeking to do. So what's beautiful about this is that I think that no matter how young the children are, is what Bruner, uh, Jerome Bruner used to say, you know, there's always like an intellectually responsible way to teach complex content to uh, children of any age. And I think that our challenge as educators is exactly that. You know, how do we reframe it so that the essence uh, is there? Any other sort of observations, comments, reactions? Yes. And we had never considered that our work could be published before. And so I think if you've ever heard of the Golden Circle, I think as teachers, at least in Maryland, you write students well, and we're always telling the students what they'll do. We don't always tell them why. And as reading and writing teachers, we tell them that they write to inform, to explain, and to persuade. But I think letting your kids write from an early age, you're showing them that they have the opportunity to inform, explain, persuade, and when they read newspaper articles, magazine articles, I'm an ESOL teacher. It's from an adult perspective. It's usually from a upper, you know, class or a urban. I mean, a suburban perspective. Is their chance to give a child's perspective, a teenager's perspective, a urban perspective, a you know, Mexican American, uh, Arabic American. I know that's not the right way to say it, but their way to give their perspective. So I think teaching from a young age is great. I think a challenge for teachers, and I'm glad that's about your project, is not all teachers know how to create blogs or a good forum or a way for the kids to publish. So having a place where they can publish or having links or places that are secure, well-known, you know, children or teen publishing areas would be really helpful to teachers because it gives a student a why. Hey, this is my chance to show my opinion or my stance on it. So I'm excited about the project and I'd like to know about other publishing platforms for children and, and uh, teens. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know we're on time to, to close this session. So what I would like to say is that I've, I've had sort of the privilege of working with the IB on a variety of different projects. And for the most part, this is like very quiet work. Nobody knows anything about the work that we're doing. Or not that nobody knows. It's like people know that the work is happening, but, it's, but, but, but we do not talk directly with one another about you know, the work that's, that's taking place. Uh, this, uh, in this case, what I love about this opportunity is that we're hoping to have a space within the IB site where we can uh, keep uh, the IB community updated on the very progress uh, of, of, of the work and how, you know, how um, maybe like a small blog or something like that that would allow us to get your feedback, to get sort of ideas, uh, as well as, you know, keep uh, the progress uh, of the work um, uh, visible, uh, so to speak. So um, with that, um, Marvin, you have something in mind. I think that comment that you made, that suggestion, is extremely important but very complicated because there are good ideas, there are good proposals, but if they're not presented in a way that I don't mean just attracts the eye, but attracts the mind, in fact tickles the mind, um, you're not gonna have an audience. So the fact that we have the internet means that there is almost automatically a very large audience if you're gonna put your students' work on the web. It's wonderful, it's ego gratification, it's terrific. Except, we can't be so mesmerized by the, by the reach of the web to lose sight of two things. One is content, true content. Not baloney, but content, something that elevates, not something that simply, bah. And the second thing is the way you say something. 
The English language is a beautiful language when used well. And so words have meaning. Certain words have meaning in a certain context, but not in another. And if you can somehow persuade your students that the use of the language is often as important as the content, that is rich. That is, is enriching. And, um, but I love your idea. I think it, it's terrific, but it's complicated. Um, anyway, I just wanted to thank you. All right, so I think that with that, I would like to thank Marvin and, and, and Mark for sort of for joining us and thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.